The Unshackled Waves, episode 32. Hello and welcome to the Unshackled Waves podcast. I'm Tim Wills, here for another interview show. We are lucky to be joined today by a good friend of the Unshackled, Bruce Wayne. He is the founder and editor of fellow Australian alternative news website, altrightaustralia.com. They publish news com- and commentary about Australia and international politics, including many stories that aren't covered by the mainstream media and from a pro-Australian and pro-Western viewpoint. They've recently branched out and are now producing video content on a regular basis. So, Bruce, welcome to the show. It's good to be here, Tim. Thanks for having me. So we'll start from the beginning. This is how I I always start my interviews. Um, So what motivated you to start Alt-Right Australia? Uh, Why do you think it's needed? Um, Late last year... I don't know how I got so involved, but I got really close with watching the US election um, and seeing through like the Podesta dump on WikiLeaks, just how intertwined the mainstream media and politics really were. You know, you had like Donna Brazil from the DNC was handing Hillary questions in the primaries because they didn't want Bernie to be their candidate. Um, it really just left me wondering how much of that's going on in Australia. Um, you know, our our media does seem to fall a lot more right wing at times. You know, we do still have Channel Seven and Channel Nine that'll cover all this and the Herald Sun, but there is just this constant growth of or the constant furtherisation of left of the media going to the left, and that's just something I don't want to be a part of. And it's I just want to give Australia an alternative, something that's slightly more i wouldn't say bipartisan because it's always right leaning but i don't have anyone paying my wage you know what i'm putting out is my own thoughts yeah definitely now your site is called uh, alt-right australia so it's clear that you embrace the the term alt-right however um you stated yeah. on uh your website that you reject the ideas of the person who created the term which is uh richard spencer uh so what does the term alt-right mean in your mind look i understand that richard spencer was the one who coined alt-right um and he does have quite a large following i I don't agree with his strict ethno-nationalism, but I believe in his right to say whatever he wants. I'm a big proponent for free speech. I believe the best ideas in society will draw the most people and those ones will win. And we, you know, shouldn't be stifling control. But I believe the alt-right movement that really came to the forefront last year during the election, where, you know, you just had Trump supporting shit posting Pepe memes, um, I don't think a lot of those people were a part of Richard's movement. I think the media did a very good job to lump in anyone who was looking at Trump as this hardline alt-right, where I see it more as a group who's looking for an alternative on the right, like how we're seeing the shift from the Liberals to One Nation and United Conservative Party and all these smaller groups. and like you've seen millions of people voting Donald Trump as their president. Um, I just think the establishment right at the moment isn't listening to anyone and it's slowly falling further and further to the left. Yeah, there's uh, certainly uh, the movement that's uh, supported Trump. They definitely have uh, rejected the mainstream conservative movement and to a degree the mainstream libertarian movement. So the term alt-right, alternative rights, uh, it is a real is a really good description uh, of of this movement, but yes, sort of, uh, it, it was created by somebody who both you and me we we don't we don't agree with their views. But then again, the term capitalism was created by Karl Marx, yet it's used by free market people. So uh, I, I don't think it's that important where these term terms came from. But sort of uh, another problem with the 
uh, I guess the term alt-right is because it has largely emerged on the internet, that means that sort of anyone can attach themselves to it. Yeah, and look, the, the majority of the um, really der derogatory sort of stuff will always be hidden behind a fake profile. Um, the members in the alt-right that do speak out and seem to show a, show a better image of it are always willing to put their face to it, and that's the crowd I pay attention to. Yeah, it's it's certainly like, uh, and also every movement has its uh, out there crazy people. I mean, we don't judge the the left by the uh, the uh, the actions of the socialist alternative all the time. Yeah, exactly. And look, it did cross my mind to stop publishing under the name of Alt Right Australia, but then I thought about it. Like even a couple of years ago, I went to a few of the Patriot rallies in Melbourne and Bendigo. And I was called a Nazi just for attending those. Um, I went to two. The first one was out of just pure curiosity to see how big it was. And the second time, yeah, I was there in support. But, you know, I don't want to kill Jews. I don't believe in authoritarian government. Um, I believe in creating a government that will be controlled by people that you don't like. Take the power away. Everyone goes, oh, you know, we need to be able to do this, this. But what happens when someone you don't like is voted in? You know, um, I'm much more a libertarian in that sense, which makes Nazism like, as a label for me absolutely retarded. Well, of course, calling someone a Nazi is sort of one of the worst insults that you can probably put upon somebody. I mean, that's why it's it's used as a term of demonization to, to people who are a part of our movement. And it's really every time they bring up the Holocaust or the Nazis and label someone who's only slightly leaning to the right, that's an insult to the Jewish people and all the soldiers that had to fight the Nazis. You just, you're lessening the impact of what that man actually did. To say there's someone in comparison to him in present day, it is. It's an insult to everyone that that re regime ended up killing. Yeah, that, that's an interesting point to, to make. Now, uh, let's talk about uh, how, your, how you came to your current political beliefs. Now, you're from the bush, so sort of did your upbringing influence your values? How did it all come about? Um, well, I, I did come from a, a liberal voting family. Um, I'm used to hearing insults about the Greens and Labor since I was a little kid, but I think like one of the major influences on me were a couple of teachers I had through primary school who put a massive emphasis on Australian history. Um, we had one music teacher who'd be singing songs about the Cali Gang and Burke and Wheels and stuff like that, and it's just something I got interested in at a very young age. So I remember a school excursion to the uh, Blood on the Southern Cross uh, exhibition in Ballarat where you can go in and go through the old go gold mining town and get to see the Eureka Stockade recreated. It just, it, it felt like an insult from the left that when I grew up, they just seemed to denigrate this entire culture and burn the flags that I just seemed to fall in line with the right. Uh, I've also noticed uh, from reading a lot of your um, uh, articles on uh, Alt-Right Australia that you've got quite a strong libertarian streak in you. Would that be fair to say as well? All right, yeah. Look, I, I would identify largely as a libertarian. I think as long as people aren't hurting anyone, they should be left to their own devices. Um, a lot of, I think a lot of what the police force do is raise revenue to fill tax holes. Um, it's not a slight against the entire police force, it's more so just the direction they're being pushed in. Yeah, I can consider myself a libertarian and I definitely think there is quite a libertarian streak in the, the alt-right because it's mainly people who, you know, they just want to be left alone but they're seeing, uh, you know, governments trying to, you know, tell people what to say, saying that they're, you know, what, uh, how they live their lives is somehow wrong and so mo most people who become politically active are only only com becoming so is because they're, they're just sick of the government, you know, ordering them around. And also the left, uh, left's attempt to sort of, you know, tell them that there's something wrong with how, how they are. There's um, a brilliant video of Kerry Packer. He's in front of a government inquiry, I think it was when he was trying to purchase a newspaper and he already owned Channel 9 or something. And he goes on to say that 
since he's been born, there's thousands upon thousands of new laws and regulations have been passed and he doesn't think this country is a darn side better for it. And I believe in that completely. You know, every new law or department or regulation is just something that's slowing down the progress and the freedoms of the smaller people in the community. Yeah, I, I remember saying that. It's a, it's a, it's a brilliant uh, piece, a piece of footage where uh, it's sad he's, he's no longer with us. Now, let's talk about uh, more about Alt-Right Australia. Now, it's been going for around about the same time as the Unshackled. So what has the experience been like and what feedback have you been receiving? Yeah, look, I was really surprised how quickly the Facebook page and the website um, sitting at around two and a half thousand likes at the moment and it's been on average probably about 200 likes a week. Um, in the comments there are you know small aspects of you know hateful people that you're going to find anywhere on Facebook but the thing I've gained the most out of it was the few times when I've already had people send me a private message ask me to share, share a story for them because they don't think that the mainstream media would listen to them or want to show a story of that aspect. Yeah, that's what I've noticed that uh, Alt-Right Australia it has had a few uh, exclusive uh, articles which sort of uh, you know, are not sort of things that are picked up in the mainstream media, just sort of stories about you know, how, how the little guy is struggling. Yeah, like there's um, the case of Johnny Foy, which is a man, I think he's in, was either Nari Warren or Danny Nong, who lives on about 14 hectares. He's a widow and he's transformed that land basically into a wildlife sanctuary with a small little hut on it. And the Casey Council is coming through to wipe down his home. And it's just basically a story of the castle all over again. Um, a man's home is his castle. I don't think the Shire has any right to come in there. And like, he's a man. I'm fairly sure he was in his late or mid 70s. He, there's a large chance he'll be dead in the next 10, 20 years. Why don't the council put in, put in place, you know, a system where maybe they can acquire the land once he has died? At, at least let this old man, you know, live out his last days in peace. Yeah, I think it's certainly something uh, unique that that alt right Australia offers. Look. I think my major problem with politics in general in Australia is that they're not listening listening to anyone and large chunks of the media aren't listening to the public either. I'd like Alt-Right Australia to be a platform and a voice for everyday Australians. I want people to be able to message me with their problems and stories that they think need to be shared. Yeah, it's it's certainly a, a, a good service that you're doing and yeah it's good that you've had positive feedback and do you sort of like because obviously when you put yourself out there uh, online and publish something you're going to attract people who are who don't like um, you know what, what you're saying or have a go at you I'm sort of the sort of person that if they're just if they just simply disagree or just attack me personally it doesn't bother me it's more if like there's a flaw pointed out in what in what I've written that that can easily be picked apart. Sort of how do you how do you sort of feel about it when you know people attack you? I'm willing to get into the comments if someone points out something that they think's wrong. Um, one problem that I did see, I posted an article comparing Colorado to Victoria with the idea of legalising cannabis and how big that industry could actually be. Um, and I think in the first or the second comment on that, a guy brought up the um, statistics with people that had THC in their system after a fatality. And that's something that is always going to occur in a state that legalises marijuana. Now, the fact that someone comes up with THC in a toxicology report after they've died doesn't in any way mean that that person was affected at the time of the crash. Now, the only time when, yeah, I do really bite back to it is when someone is trying to twist my argument or trying to say it's wrong. You know, if someone wants to call me a Nazi or something like that, um, go for it. It doesn't bother me. It's uh, water off a duck's back, mate. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, you, you learn to, like, just 
not and not take seriously a lot of the the more vile comments that are there. Now, um, as I stated uh, at the beginning, uh, so you you, pu you publish uh, articles on a wa wide variety of topics. Uh, w which ones do you do you see as people being the most engaged with? Um, the any article to do with Trump will always do better later at night, which is typically your U.S. market. Um, but during the day, and especially in Australia, it's one nation. Um, everyone just wants to seem to know what Pauline Hanson's up to and whether she's keeping the promises that she made pre-election, um, which I think in, in large she is. I posted an article yesterday which was about a motion that Pauline Hanson introduced to Senate to have an inquiry into the, the loan process to primary producers, to our farmers. And that was one of the best articles that I've been able to post in weeks. It was surprising. It was actually the eight members of the Greens that were present and Darren Hinch were the only ones that opposed this inquiry. Yeah, it's sort of, I, f I find that with articles that you post, the, may the, the things that engage people the most are certainly something, if you offer something exclusive that's not found elsewhere, that, that does well, which, which you've uh, done quite a bit, but also if it's, uh, I wouldn't, if, if sort of, uh, if it's something people view as an injustice or an, or an outrage, like if, if someone in the media, for example, I mean, whenever like Waleed Ali or uh, uh, Andrew O'Keefe, you know, say something completely ridiculous, uh, uh, if you write an article pointing that out, that'll definitely get people, um, you know, uh, outraged and sort of, you know, wanting, uh, want, uh, wanting to sort of engage with it. So sort of, uh, I find that if you, if you expose something that people view at, as, as something that's not right, uh, uh, would you say that as well? Yeah, just, um, and that's, it's just like correcting the media or correcting politicians. When someone stepped out of line, being willing, be, being willing to you know call someone on their bullshit, that that definitely does work. Waleed is another topic that yeah does get large hits because people are just sick of Muslim apologists. Um, they want to know the truth. They want to hear things based on logic instead of feelings. And sort of with the, the subject matter we cover, there is no one else uh, covering that perspective, but it's also a perspective that, as we've seen in polls, the vast majority of Australians agree with. So I think, I think the reason when you, when you sort of tackle uh, these sort of uh, you know, issues that people are most concerned about, pe people are engaged with them because you know, f they're saying, finally, there's a media organisation which uh, I agree with. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, it's just nice to to be able to read something and not roll your eyes like I do with the majority of the papers here. Um, just a, just a good alternative. And even even like I I recommend that people read our sources and also read crap that's that far to the left. It's on BuzzFeed or Slate. You just need to know all the ideas out there and then use some aspect of critical thinking to work out where reality actually is. Yeah, that's definitely correct. I mean, uh, there's there's plenty of yeah. I could probably name about fifty left wing news websites in Australia, but it is apart apart from the Murdoch media, there is uh, there is a a lot a lot lacking for for people on the right, and that's why uh, that's why we're so important here. Yeah, it it just seems like the right wing in Australia just doesn't exist under the age of about forty five. Um, we do have a few good reporters. I absolutely love Paul Murray and the work he does. Um, Andrew Bolt, I've actually become a large fan of Mark Latham recently, you know, with his charades on Sunrise that are quite entertaining to watch Andrew O'Keefe squirm. But yeah, I think you're right. It's important that there's some new younger faces on the conservative side of politics getting out there. Uh, well, certainly. Uh or oh, you and me and uh, some of the other uh, alternative media bloggers in Australia were all pretty young, which is encouraging. Yeah, and like you look at, I seen a graph yesterday, and it was showing the support for Marine Le Pen in France is coming major, majorly 
from the younger de demographic. And I think that's something with our outlets we can help grow in Australia. Yeah, definitely. Now, let's go, talk, uh, go into a bit more detail about uh, the common issues that we, we cover a lot um, on our news websites. And they are the problems with uh, immigration and open borders, the spread of Islam, and sort of the, the self-hatred the West has of itself. Now, how did we get into this state of crisis, in your opinion? Um, I think it would have a lot to do with the West just showing compassion and being a gracious sort of society where we're willing to, you know, give another culture or another person or someone seen as below us, you know, an, uh, an extra fair chance, you know. We let people into our society and we look at them with the best intentions. And I think immigration was, of course, done with the best intention. Uh, a lot of people are fleeing war. I understand that. There are some really bad places to live in the world right now. But you can't just bring people into the country and dump them in Western Sydney. Like we're having nearly half of the 12,000 Syrian refugees that are coming in and they're all getting dumped in Western Sydney. It's with no focus on integration, we're just asking for these enclaves to, to just grow. You know, tribalism's really a part of human nature. And if you constantly bring in new cultures and have no no hope of integrating them, we're just going to end up with 50 different cultures in the country that are all going to clash. I think an idea of national pride is something that all immigrants should bond to when they come into the country, and I think it would help with a lot of the culture clashes we're seeing in the city right now. So your, so your problem, um, from what you said, is not sort of immigration itself, but just how the immigration process works currently, so you'd prefer to see more uh, assimil if we are assimilation rather than sort of multiculturalism? Yes, look, I don't think I agree with the points that Dick Smith brought up, that bringing in immigrants to try and help a flailing economy is only going to make it worse in the long run. Um, I don't think immigration should be being done from an economic standpoint. I understand that Australia is better off than a lot of places in the world and we should accept some refugees, not on the scale we are, but if we were to bring them in and get them within the communities, have say like a sponsor family for every refugee that was to come into the country and that family is responsible for just showing them Australian culture, invite them around for a barbecue on a Sunday afternoon, take them down to the cricket or the footy or the beach. Um, I just think if we keep bringing people into the country, dumping them, putting them on Centrelink and never talking to them again, it's it's just going to make this country a horrible place to live. Yeah, well, that's certainly uh, an interesting perspective. So, uh, do you believe that it's do you believe that that sort of requires a cultural change, or does government need to lead? I I think it's a bit of both. You know, uh, government funded programs and advertising would always help, but it is going to have to be something from inside the community. And I think with the constant denigration of Australia's culture by the media and inside politics, it's going to be very hard to ask immigrants to integrate into that culture. Because if it's only ever shown in a negative light, why would you want to be a part of it? Um, now, there's a fella here who works down at the petrol station. He's only been here a couple of years. But last Anzac Day, we were at the back of the pub playing two up together. And that's, that's the kind of integration I'm talking about, you know. Let them know about the history and the culture and why Australia is so great and why they should want to be a part of it and leave old cultures and traditions behind to the most extent. Yes, it's an interesting perspective because I've heard um, conservative commentators argue that uh, because we denigrate, you know, our culture and history so much, no wonder people turn to, you know, foreign cultures and and cling, and cling to those. So certainly, if we if we have a more positive view of ourselves, that will that will filter through. And yeah, look, I think that's something that needs to be done through the media and through film. 
and through the right wing side of politics there needs to be just more of an emphasis on the good side of Australian history and culture as well. Uh, now a lot of us sort of rage against as we call uh, social justice warriors, political correctness and the progressive left. Uh, what, what sort of your take on, uh, I guess, uh, if I use these words, who we're up against. I mean, who are the people who are responsible for this, you know, denigration of the West and Australia? What, what do you, how, how do you sort of see, uh, view them? Um, uh, mainly, it's a problem with social Marxism. Um, I think this is a political strategy, strategy that is being employed by the left in Australia. Um, the media is joining in on it. I don't know whether it's directly or more so for the point that empathy stories sell, you know, shock sells, and they'll move on this. The, the left has broken everyone up into these smaller groups and placed us basically in a pyramid system where the more oppressed you are, the higher you sit up the pyramid. Now, the problem with this is it's gotten that dogmatic and people are that attached to this minority trait of their identity that you're having violent rallies in Australia and in America now with Antifa and Black Lives Matter and groups like that, that they think anyone below them in the social Marxist pyramid who's op oppressing them, they can attack. And it's, it's just not good for our society. Um, and I think it is definitely something that needs to be counted. And it's something I hope to do with alt-right Australia. And how do you sort of view the current state of the Western world in 2017? I mean, last year we had some big victories with Brexit, the election of Trump, and of course the return of Pauline Hanson here in Australia. So do you think we are beginning to sort of take back uh, uh, our country and sort of, uh, you know, stop the march of, of the left? There, yeah, there was definitely uh, a lot of large wins last year. Um, I think the war's far from over. Uh, we've got, we've had a few small wins, but it will be really interesting to see how politics play out this year in Europe. There's a few countries that will be heading to the polling, including France. And I think if we can see a couple more countries break away from the EU, then yes, I think the political center of the world and Australia will be shifted to a point where it's it's not going to slide back to where it was five or ten years ago. And what about Australia in particular? I mean, uh, we've got uh, Malcolm Turnbull uh, leading the Liberal Party, who's, who's very left-wing, uh, and of course we've got the, the Labor Party, uh, assisted by the Greens, who are still very committed to, to left-wing ideas. Uh, we've, we've got, uh, obviously, Pauline Hanson back, but one Nation is having its its problems. We've seen uh, Corey Bernardi break away to, to form Australian Conservatives. Do you think that the right can unite in Australia and um, we can sort of fight this sort of bipartisan uh, left-wing approach to policy? That's, that's going to be the major problem with the right wing. Um, you know, we have a political system that we have to play inside and to be able to do that, we need people to align with each other. Um, fingers crossed that egos don't get in the way because that's usually what plagues um, plagues alliances and problems in politics. But if if they can really come together and work out preferences or even a future alliance to try and get power in government, I, I think we really do really do face a large chance of getting in there and making some change. I think one of the reasons why the left has been so successful is because they're so organised and they've also got so many different organisations to, to help them out. I mean, I've handed out how to vote cards on election day and there's about 10 different left-wing groups there they're handing out. So certainly the right really needs to have a better ground game in, in politics and also advocacy, which is sort of difficult for us because the right are traditionally the ones who are out there working most of the time. Yeah, it, it just seems like grassroots right wing is basically non-existent in Australia in comparison.
Harrison to the left. You know, you've got your Socialist Alliance and your smaller groups inside the Greens, but and uh, also organisations like Get Up that will organise, you know, street marches and uh, media campaigns. But that just hasn't seemed to exist on the right. I think if we can get, you know, all our cards in the right order before the election. Um, I think the right could stand a yeah a very large chance of getting in there. Do you think it's because our natural in inclination is to leave people alone, and that's why we don't get engaged in this advocacy? While the left, they're they're always about wanting to control us, so it's only natural that they, you know, have this ground game and uh, organisational structure. That's yeah. Look, I think you'll find a lot of people that are less interested in politics are more conservative or more right wing. You know, they'll see something on the news and they'll agree with it from a right wing standpoint, but they're not going to get on the internet and start up some group and drag 50 people down to the front of Melbourne Uni or something like that. It's, yeah, I think uh, the conservative side of politics does seem to be the working class a lot more as well. And the it's the universities um, largely where they've got us because it's just full of left-wing politics and that's where a lot of these action groups come from. I think also the the internet and social media has benefited the right uh, a lot because barriers to sort of uh, meeting people with similar political beliefs and sort of uh, you know we can just create a Facebook group and we've sort of got a uh, got a working working group so so I really think that the power of the internet has really I guess engaged uh, and motivated the right a lot more than probably in the past. I mean, uh, it's been it's been much e much easier for us to uh, get into the media ourselves. We've just had to uh, you know uh, get a website up and you know we're we're good to go. Well, sort of in the old days, we would have had to have uh, organised a, a print uh, get a printer and distribution, and it would have been uh, been much harder. So, do you think we've been assisted by sort of the accessibility? of the internet? Yeah, I think largely. Um, it also gives you a chance to make a rebuttal. I think for a long time anyone who was conservative or leaning to the right would be scared of how their words were going to be edited on mainstream media and would then in turn turn down any interviews. So there didn't seem to be as much of a right-wing voice. But now with Facebook Live, you know, you can broadcast yourself watching anything on mainstream media or within seconds you can make a video showing what you actually said and you have a chance for people to make up their own mind. Yeah, I mean if you look at uh, the rise of Donald Trump, it was it was largely an internet based phenomenon. I mean the entire mainstream media was against him, yet he was able to communicate directly with the people uh, via his Twitter account and uh, with spend a lot of time on Facebook and we saw like hundreds of pro-Trump groups popping up with tens of thousands of members so it, it really did uh, empower and help propel him to the presidency. Yeah and I think Trump really understood that and it really did help him to win the election. Now I think it was the second or maybe the third inauguration ball that he went to after the inauguration He's walked out and he's got a big smile on his face and says to the crowd, what do you think? Should I keep the Twitter? And starts laughing and he just, he knows what it did for him. It gave him that chance to speak directly to the public. Yeah, and it's, uh, like I said before, it's it's let everyone else know that they're, they're not alone in in their views and so that's why people have become, uh, I guess, I guess a lot more... Uh, unafraid of of saying saying what they believe. Now let's talk about um, where we we've spoken quite a bit about the bias and dishonesty of the mainstream media. Though we ourselves have attracted the attention of the the mainstream media. There was an Age article late last year talking about the the keyboard warriors, the alt right, which uh, we were both fe uh, featured in, <coughs> and we were both recently uh, interviewed about a. Uh, about a segment uh, on the alt right for the Project TV show, which we're hoping should air by the time this uh, episode is up. Uh, of course, they like to paint us as extremists, or white supremacists, or of course, say we're fake news. Um, what's your response to the way the mainstream media generally behaves towards us? Um, with personal interactions, I was very surprised that 
how tame the article was in the age. I don't know whether I've become desensitized to words like white supremacist and Nazi and keyboard warrior that I just seem to skip straight past them when I'm reading an article with them. Um, you know, for an average person, it might have seemed a lot more slighted, but all those insults and buzzwords are something that I ignore now. Um, and even with with the staff that came here from the from the project, their producer and one of the cameramen, um, I only felt like he tried to pigeonhole me once, where he brought up uh, whether I felt like I was standing up for the white male. But I think as long as you stop and think before you speak, it, it's easy to just to make sure to just just to try and minimise uh, how they're going to portray you in a bad light, because. I honestly think that once this article comes out, well, sorry, this segment comes out on the project, you know, I wouldn't be surprised in the slightest if it's edited fairly, fairly badly. Yeah, uh, as long as they, uh, uh, from my point of view, don't misrepresent any uh, any of my answers, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not too worried. I mean, we've all, <laughs> we've all joked about the, uh, for those who don't know, there's the Homer Simpson uh, sweet can video edited where it's manipulated which so sort of as long as they don't do that <laughs> I, I, I don't I don't really care yeah yeah and look I am um, I also recorded my own copy of all the questions um, I've gone through the only editing I've done was to take the cameraman out of the footage and I also cropped out the voice of the producer who was asking me the questions and I've just written a question in a title form that'll sit there for two or three seconds and then there's my answer to it. Um, I am looking to put that up on my Facebook probably as soon as the episode airs on the project just because not even if they've edited, edited the segment with some sort of malice, I understand that it'll probably be a five minute segment at most and there was a few of us interviewed so they can probably only fit in 20 seconds of what was around 10 to 15 minutes worth of interview yeah uh, yeah they probably will only use i mean yeah we sat down for about half an hour they probably use a minute or less of uh of what we said but yeah with all these like yeah buzzwords like yeah like, like you said before white supremacist i mean uh it's just used as a slur so often now that no nobody takes it seriously anymore yeah, they've, yeah, the left has definitely overplayed it by labelling, you know, anyone who's slightly conservative as racist and Nazi bigot that it just doesn't hurt anymore because people are going, you know, I'm not, I'm not this person, I'm not saying anything that portrays that, why are these people calling me this? Oh, they call everyone that, who cares? But it also backfires as well because if, if the public sees somebody unfairly being slandered, then they're obviously going to want to know a lot more about that person and investigate and maybe yeah. even look at and look at what, you know, they've actually published and think, no, yeah, they're actually quite reasonable despite what, you know, this TV show or uh, news website said. Yeah, you've just got to look at like the riots that happened at UC Berkeley when Milo Yiannopoulos was meant to speak. His book, although it's cancelled now, um, went up, I think it was 12,740% overnight because of that riot. You know, these people that are trying to shut down this man and think he shouldn't be allowed to speak or have a platform are actually helping him build it. Yeah, it's... Uh, the left, they don't, they don't seem to... It doesn't seem to process in their mind that uh, the the more they sort of carry on, the the more attention that that they're they're giving to somebody they don't like, and it's and it's also the fact that uh, they're they're employing this strategy that if they repeat somebody as a white supremacist or a Nazi so many times, it will become true. But sort of the 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 game is is really up, and and people people are much more wise to the left's tactics now, which is I think why they're just resorting to violence now. Yeah, yeah, just acting like spoiled children that aren't being listened to because they're wrong. Um, I think I'm going to quite enjoy people trying to label me as a Nazi and a white supremacist because I'm posting on a website that's alt-right Australia. But 
they are never going to be able to find anything that I've written or I've said that proves those points because that's not who I am. Uh, I've often said that if we're what, pass, what passes for racist these days, then there's not that many racists to worry about. It's, yeah, I, I can't remember where I heard this term, but it's society just seems to nitpick at every problem once it's been out of war for too long. Um, I'm not advocating another war. I'm just saying that when you don't have this imminent imminent threat to your life and since life has become so easy with, you know, cars and travel and air conditioning and electricity and all the technology that we've got now, that there's no struggle for, for people to build themselves against, that they're just nitpicking these stupid ideas and people are just getting sick of it. Yeah, I mean, it's like the, the fact that there's uh, subliminal racism now that oh, just because, you know, you're not, you're not racist towards people doesn't mean there's, there's like a, a ra racist thoughts in the back of your mind in how you behave. And also, you know, with uh, uh, feminism and the idea of the patriarchy, that even if you treat women with respect, there's still uh, this idea of the patriarchy around you know, uh, just coming up with these. But because we have solved you know, most racism and sexism now, there's sort of these, these new uh, 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 over-the-top uh, over, over terms. And that's, and that's another label there that I'm happy to laugh at all day long. Like, if you want to call me a sexist, you know, I have a young daughter that I'm trying to build up to be a strong, independent woman that doesn't need to rely on a boyfriend for an income so that, you know, when she does, you know, I would like to her to follow a more traditional route, you know, and, have, and find a husband and have children. But I also want her to have her own economic stability. You know, I want to build up her as a strong, as a strong person that's not dependent on someone else, you know. I've got two sisters. I've got multiple nieces, you know. I've got a mother that I love to call me a sexist. It's just stupid. Yeah. And I, I've always said that women should be able to do, you know, wh whatever they want. I mean, uh, I think we've made great progress over the past 50 years in the West, and it's certainly uh, definitely better to be a woman in the West than in another part of the world. There's, yeah, the, look, there's another interview I've seen with Christopher Hitchens, and the lady's talking to him uh, about having a wife and, you know, whether he'd want his wife to work. And he, he laughs and he goes, no, no, like, you know, I'd much rather have a wife that, you know, could stay at home and tend to the house and the children. And she's, you've, you've got to be kidding, Christopher. You know, the reporter goes, he goes, oh, yes, I've, seen that. He's, I've come to a point in my life where, you know, I'm, I can financially look after another person. You know, uh, he's not saying that his wife cannot work, but he said he's happy to, you know, if he finds a person that doesn't want to, that enjoys more of that homely role, and I think a lot of women like that do exist. Yeah, I mean, oh, at the end of the day, like you know, we're we're pretty confident in in our own beliefs, and so I think that's why uh, why you know we we learn just to shrug off these you know racist sexist labels. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, you now produce uh, video content. Now, one segment you'll be doing weekly now is uh, your Q&A pull-apart, uh, which is uh, fact-checking all of the, the garbage that is spewed on that program week in, week out. For, for those who might not have heard of a Q&A before, it's a program on the state, state media outlet, Australian Broadcasting Corporation. They have a series of uh, about five panellists and the host, and most of the guests are of a left-wing perspective and so are the audience and so it's basically you know a, a left-wing echo chamber most of the time so my question to you is why have you decided to do this uh, given that the program is so torturous to watch i mean why do it to yourself um yeah look it did turn out to be a lot more tedious than i expected at first but like you just said it's one, it tends to be one massive left-wing echo chamber. You know, they might get one conservative or someone from the right in who just gets shouted over or shut down by Tony Jones any time they try to make a decent point. Um, like a lot of people, um, I don't think, and, you know, I don't... Oh, sorry. Uh, a lot of people, and I don't disagree with them, can't sit down and watch an hour of the Q&A. Um, 
which I largely understand. So what I'm trying to do is just compress it down to somewhere between five to ten minutes so people can see the core points of it and it's not just to get rid of that brainless argument that seems to fill at least 70% of the show. Uh, from when I do put myself through the show, I mean, they're, I mean, the panellists are all agreeing like, oh, this is, you know, such the, the right way to deal with an issue. I can't believe why everyone, you know, do, it doesn't think like us or our government doesn't do this. And then the audience, you know, give, it, give a round of applause. It's basically that everyone in that studio is like, oh, you know, we're, we're so enlightened, you know, we're, we're so smart. Uh, I just can't believe the world's not like me. Yeah, look, I don't think it's hard to get a round of applause if you're leaning anywhere to the left inside that room. And another major problem I have with it is the questions themselves. You know, um, they're just so rehearsed and put out theatrically that it just doesn't sound like something that a real Australian would ask. Yeah, I mean, they've become known for, as it's known, the gotcha questions, where they're, it's, it's always a conservative uh, panellist. They'll have someone from the audience say, oh, you know, I'm really struggling with this, and, you know, you're trying to screw me over. What's what's your response? And and it's they're, they're starting to get caught out uh, a bit for it now. There was the, the famous case last year of this... Uh, uh, this father who uh, who was uh, who was complaining about that oh, he wasn't um, he, he wasn't getting uh, enough welfare and it turned out that you know he, he was a deadbeat dad himself. Yeah, that, that was the man with his toaster or Duncan, his kettle Duncan, or something Duncan like that. Stora. Yeah, it was the toaster. And that yeah, he ended up getting like what between somewhere between ten and fifty thousand at if I get it in memory. Yeah. Uh, they had a GoFundMe, the, the lefties. And, yeah, and look, even last week, um, they had this fella come on, he was an immigrant, asking questions about, it was, uh, it actually had integration sort of tones to it, but about immigration, and they went straight to Jackie Lambie, and Tony Jones pulled out something that she said to The Guardian in Tasmania about her agreeing with Donald Trump. Um, you know, I think the panel knowing the questions ahead of time, um, especially Tony Jones, makes it unfair to the panelists. Like, it was dead obvious that that was a complete setup. Yeah, it's. But but even though these these criticisms have been pointed out for well over a year now, the 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 program still gets away with it, and it, and it's still got the the stamp of the approval from uh, the Australian government, um, paid for by our taxes. Yeah, it just seems like it's not connected to the government at all. Like you wouldn't think that that's the broadcasting corporation of a what's meant to be a right-leaning conservative party. I th I think the uh, the best way to pitch your your Q and A pull apart every week is that you watch it so we don't have to. <laughs> yeah, basically that's it, and it's. One bloke said to me, he's like, oh, you know, where's the full copy of this? And I said to him, mate, it's over an hour every week. You know, I'm trying to compress this. There's always going to be people say that I've edited it in a bad light, but I'll never try and mince someone's words. It's just trying to make it more palatable to a younger audience that mightn't be that interested in politics. Uh, even if you watch the whole thing, the, the panellists are just as mindless as they are in your pull apart. Yeah, exactly. Look, I um, I actually became a large fan of James Patterson though, watching the show last week. Um, so it does have its odd benefits. He, he just seemed to stand his ground very well, and also spoke from a point of logic and and common sense. You know, he might have uh, been uh, portrayed poorly for his harsh stance on childcare, but. I can understand, you know, the country's still in a deficit. We do have to tighten the belt in certain areas. And, you know, I, I really appreciated him at least sticking to his guns when he had Jackie Lambie screaming at him. Yeah, oh, there, there's always uh, a few brave people on the right who are prepared to go on. So I, I think, yeah, any conservative or libertarian who goes on the show is uh, at my respect. Uh, look, that's probably all we've got time for on today's show. Um, so th thank you, uh, Bruce, for being a guest on our show. No, that's fine. I'll um, be back soon, hopefully. 
And don't forget to check out the uh, Alt-Right Australia's website, which is altrightaustralia.com. Uh, also, like them on Facebook, which is where you can see all of the, the videos uh, we discussed. Uh, so, and we look forward to working, working with Alt-Right Australia uh, well into the future. I think that's uh, definitely going to happen. All right, that's the show for today. So I'll be back next week for another review show. I'm sure there'll be more controversy, which seems to be coming in thick and fast at the moment. So there'll be plenty to discuss. Of course, uh, I'll just go through our usual reminders. Don't forget, if you haven't yet, sign up to the email list at theunshackled.net slash subscribe. Also, don't forget that you can support the work of The Unshackled by becoming a patron on Patreon, donate via PayPal, or you can also sign up to advertise with us. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to the show on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, or view the video version on YouTube. Don't forget to visit theunshackled.net for all the latest news. And thanks once again for listening, and we'll see you next time.